We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. I'd just like to remind our listeners before we begin to check out our Facebook page at Palisades Gold Radio, as well as our Twitter at Palisades Radio and our website, palisadesradio.ca. These platforms serve as a great way for us to interact, to share your questions and comments with me and any show ideas that you would like to see covered. Joining me today is David Morgan, founder of themorganreport.com. How are you today, David? Not sure, Tom. <laughs> I'm doing okay. Thank you. And thanks for having me. It's been a while. Yeah, it has. And uh, it's always good to catch up with you. And and maybe that's the most the most honest answer that we've we've had for for a long time to that question. <laughs> so when we when we think about the the risks to the financial system right now, leverage could be one of the biggest. So why don't we start by talking about leverage within the system? And if you could maybe give us some examples of how big some of this leverage really is and how it could hasten the unwind when we really see a market stumble. Uh, that's a mouthful. Well, first of all, let's go on a retail level. So if you have a stock brokerage account, either with a full service broker or some online electronic brokerage service, and you elect to sign the paperwork, you can have a margin account. The margin account just means that you're able to borrow money from that broker and use that for leverage. So instead of buying 100 shares of stock, you can buy 100 with your cash and say another 100, depends on the broker what the margin limits and requirements are, but you can buy another 100. And this is, of course, really a part of a big part of the story in the 1929 crash, there was excessive leverage in the system. So, you know, futures market, which I'm intimately familiar with, is probably another good way to explain it. And the futures market, depending on the contract, if it's orange juice or soybean meal or silver or oats, there's different requirements from the CME, the Commodity Mercantile Exchange. And in some areas, you get a little more leverage than others, but they're all levered, which means that in silver, generally speaking, you get about a five to one. So if you put up $1,000, you can buy $5,000 worth of silver. You put up $25,000, you can buy $125,000 worth of silver. And it works great. For every penny or dollar that the silver market moves up, if you're betting that the price is going higher, instead of earning a dollar, you're earning five. So it's wonderful, but it does the same on the way down. So if you're betting silver is going up from a certain level and it goes down, instead of losing a dollar for every ounce and price of a dollar, you're losing five. And when that happens, most people are under collateralized or over leveraged, which means that they either have to put up more of the product, which would be silver in our example, or more cash. And a lot of people don't have the cash, so the broker sells them out. And you can end up in a position where your entire stake in it with your broker is wiped out and you still owe them money because of the leverage. So that's, uh, I think, one of the better examples. I'll just add a little bit more. So that type of leverage doesn't exist for the retail investor in the stock market, with a few exceptions. I could go on and on. I mean, if you go into options market and you margin that. I mean, you can get pretty extreme leverage. Where you get that type of extreme leverage I just outlined even greater is with the hedge funds using uh, the bond market as their basis, levered up on how they purchase bonds at maybe 10 to 1, so putting up 1,000 and getting 10,000 worth of bonds, pledging that asset as, uh, as something they can borrow against and lever up against that for a stock position where they've doubled their position. Ever. So there can be some really extreme leverage in the professional ranks, and there is. And so again, the warning being that, uh, you know, it works both directions. It's wonderful when things are moving up, when your betting is going up, and it's horrible when they go down if your betting is going up. On the other hand, if your betting is going down and it goes up, you're in the same position. So I really don't think leverage is, um, I'm not against it, but I'm not really, of the mindset after all these years in the industry thinking that it's suitable for most people. 
quick example from my personal life, I'll go on. So, you know, I've been in the silver market for so long, and I forget the year, it was years ago. I mean, my dad's been deceased for like 30, and he was still you know, alive at the time, and I had silver, uh, I had a good silver um, physical position. And so it gotten back down to five. And my dad says, you know, it's probably not a bad time to you can lever that up, you know? And I said, yeah, God, I can't go below five. And pretty much it didn't. And it got up to 11. And uh, I, you know, made some pretty good money. Not only, you know, the $6 move, but I was levered up about three to one. And I called my broker and called my broker and called my broker and called my broker. I couldn't get out. It only it never got the phone answered never got through. So here I am in the profit zone, willing to take a profit. And it fell off pretty hard. So, you know, that's just, that's my personal story. I don't want to dwell on it. But even when you win, sometimes you lose. So I, I forget, I don't want to lie to the best of my memory. You know, I got out a couple of dollars cheaper than that or whatever, but I wanted to sell and I couldn't, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because I mean, the phone was taken off the hook or answering other calls or last in line or whatever. So, and, and I think that's an important point, Tom, is that, you know, it can be right. I'll go one step further because all these things flood in my mind. I've been at this for so long. When the Washington agreement was signed, and I forget early 2000s, I forget what year exactly, but gold took off uh, substantially. And it was in the, if I remember right, in the 300 somewhere. And I had multiple calls from people that had options and gold went, I was going to make up numbers for the right idea. You can check the numbers, you know, audience, if you want. I'm going to say it went from 320 to 350 or something. So in the options market with all that leverage, you know, you should have made that $30 or maybe a slight bit less. And these people were just getting hammered on not making the money that they should have based on the spot price moving that far. And I explained to them the way the options market works along with some others is that uh, the exchange will let you, you know, mark to market. So they let these options guys, you know, it's an, a, a, bid, a bid ask situation. I'm asking this price. Well, I'm only going to pay you this. So that 350, I'll pay you 334. Well, wait a minute. I'm going to make it 10 bucks and the spot price is this. So that happens as well. So, you know, even when you're right, it can be not as lucrative as you might expect. Um, so I, again, I'm free market. If you want to use it, use it. But, you know, I think this little discussion may give you a bit of a pause, even because, you know, people trust me as they should. I'm not perfect. I've made mistakes. I continue to make them, but I admit them. And, um, you know, if I had to do that broker thing all over again, I probably would have sold at 10 instead of 11 when no one wanted to sell on the way up or something. But back to you, Tom. Thank you. Well, hopefully, hopefully you have a, a better broker now and a better better way of of getting out of some of those positions, David. Lesson was well learned, and I do. yes, thank you. No doubt, and of course, as you as you mentioned, we've we've never seen as much leverage as there is in the system uh, in, in the equities markets as right now. But that also extends in the in the crypto market right now with something like Tether. Is is that correct? It is. And I'm doing a series. I'm calling it a conspiracy because I don't need the flack. You know, I'll just say it's a conspiracy right off the bat. That way people say, oh, it's just a conspiracy and it kind of covers me so I can say what I'm determining on this investigation. I'm doing it with multiple people right now. I've had John Perez, who he and I have had an ongoing conversation for well over a year. And I just had interviewed Cyrus Parsa from the AI organization. I'm just trying to find as many facts as I can and mm -hmm. kind of put the crumbs down and let people follow the crumbs where they, where they fall and make up their own doggone mind. But yeah, I'm suspicious of this whole system based on what Tether is, uh, what their assets are, if there's a connection to Evergrande or not. I don't know. But I am, again, I'll use the word suspicious of if this whole system based on Tether is on the up and up. And there are severe indicators that there are problems ahead. So I just want to warn people, look, I'm free market. I said it twice and I continue to believe it. If you want to go full in on some crypto asset or a particular one that's uh, the most popular or whatever, who am I to say don't do it? I know from my experience, when you go all in on any one asset, 
better be careful. I mean, there's we teach diversification for a reason. The reason I'm saying, you know, most people are very well served by a 10 or 20% position in precious metals is that's huge relative to the general public that owns zero. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a lot of flexibility that other 80% to go into other asset classes, go into real estate, go into stock market, go into bond market, go into private partnerships, and start a business, be a private uh, investor, I mean, private equity. So there's a lot of things. And why not? Why not uh, enjoy the benefits? Uh, even the Morgan Report, you know, we're not just silver and gold. I mean, our uranium picks have done pretty well. Uh, we do have some crypto in there. Um, what else? A couple of asymmetric trades. So anyway, Tom, uh, that's that's the idea for me. Is you know you're better you're better off with a strong foundation that's spread out in uh, sectors rather than um, you know become religious about a certain investment. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more, David. And I'd like to move a little bit to you know kind of what we're seeing right now. So obviously. You know, yesterday we saw Powell announce that he wants to stop using the word transitory when it comes to inflation. <laughs> he also mentioned that they could speed up the tapering schedule. So is this really a recognition that they are and always have been behind the curve? I think so. I mean, I've looked at the Fed. I mean, uh, you know, there are people that are Fed watchers. Uh, I mean, James Grant, without a doubt, in my strong opinion, is probably the best. I used to subscribe to Grant's interest rate observer. I don't anymore, but I think he's as solid as they get. And, it, you know, you've already summarized it. I mean, all they can do now at this point is rhetoric. They can talk about it and they can pretend. And yeah, they might start to so, show some taper, but it's almost meaningless at this point. They're stuck. I mean, as the late, great Richard Russell said, inflate or die. And giving credit where credit is due, Jim Poplava, who was from the Financial Sense News Hour, uh, he and I have a, had and still do a strong relationship. And Jim, one summer, years ago, read, I don't know, multiple books and determined that in a pure fiat system, there's only been one route, and that was basically an inflationary depression. In other words, there's never been a deflationary depression where the currency um, – it became worth more uh, in a unbacked system. So in other words, like in the 30s, we were gold back. Now, of course, gold was confiscated or nationalized is the preferred word I use these days. But regardless of whatever word you use, you couldn't invest in gold. You had to turn it in if you're a U.S. citizen. But yet it was still used as backing internationally, not internally, uh, the monetary system. So there you got a backed currency that was a debt liquidating depression where money became more valuable. So that's a heads up caution. Now, I don't want to go one more step further, Tom, and I know you'll let me. In the system we're in now, it's, it's wrong in a way for me, for my Austrian school friends to say you can have both. But I'm going to say it. I think you can have um, what could be considered inflationary, perhaps even hyperinflationary on some systems such as extremely needed, like gasoline, food, um, maybe semiconductors until that supply chain gets straightened out. Lumber was an example. You know, I mean, if you did a metric on a one-month basis, you could make an argument it was hyperinflationary because it's backed off. My point being is you're going to see a lot of things that are needed go up, up, maybe down, all around. And then the general system, I think, is going to be deflationary because once the run on the dollar starts, if you don't want a dollar, you know, one week from now, why would you buy a 30-year bond and own it for 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. So once the bond market starts to implode, I don't know how much control the Fed will really have. Obviously, up until this point, they've had far more control than really I believe they could, but they have, and I admit that. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's going to last forever, especially when the next war isn't going to be so much a shooting war in my study view. It's going to be more of a cyber attack or a financial war. I mean, for example, let's just say we're using leverage and I'm with the CCP. I'm the Chinese Communist Party and I'm their number one top financial advisor. And over the last six months, I've built an options position that hell can't handle. It's so big. 
to short the United States bond. And now I start shorting the bond or start selling the bond, which is basically shorting it. I don't want it. So you're selling it. And I put so much selling pressure on the bond that the bond market really starts to go down noticeably. It spooks the market. Well, other algorithms will pick that up and add to it, just like when they crash the silver market. I mean, it's a because of a volume of so many cells that cause more cells that cause more cells still. And that happens, but the Chinese are you know, applauding themselves because they're getting whatever the market will give them for their cash value on the bond market. But the options market is leveraged. So every time it goes down, they're making that $5 instead of that $1. So they're actually in the net profit zone, even though the bond market is crashing because they were so careful building their position in the options market. Of course, there's counterparty risk and national security issues and all kinds of things I could throw at you, Tom, to kind of obfuscate what I just said. I'm doing it more as a thought experiment than an actual, oh, would they do that kind of scenario? Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to point out two things we already discussed, how big the leverage is, how it works, and how it could work uh, in the financial markets potentially and cause disruptions that uh, today no one really sees coming. Hmm. And to your earlier point there, David, you know, if if we do see a market crash and we do see the the Fed react by you know removing their tapering schedule or or you know not mo- not moving towards increasing interest rates, how effective do you think those those measures will be? Is the amount of liquidity being pushed into the system losing its effectiveness? Yes, I mean, I think you know Marty Armstrong is a pretty good thinker. You know, and I, I don't want words in his mouth, so I'll just say the way I understand it is, is this. And if this is what he said, I certainly agree with it. You know, at some point, it's a psychological thing. It's, it's a give up on government. They just jawbone this thing and they've lied about everything. So now they're saying one more time that, you know, we've got it under control. Don't worry about it. We're flooding the market with liquidity. Everything's fine. Go back to sleep. At some point, the you know crying wolf doesn't work anymore, and uh, and I agree with that idea. It's been proven more than once in the market. So again, you know, he states that it, uh, you know inflation isn't a you know monetary phenomena. I would somewhat disagree. I mean, inflation is an increase in the money supply, but I think what he's really pointing out is that you can have a huge increase in the money supply and no inflation, and he's right. It's only when you get that psychological tipping point, that aha moment for a small amount of people that that momentum carries through. And as I said before, selling to get, selling to get, selling. And all of a sudden, what started as just, you know, one obscure boutique brokerage house that unloaded the U.S., you know, 10-year note and caused a stir to another computer that sniffed it out and said, you know what, I'm going to hedge here. I'm going to go short also. And that's one that's watched by Deutsche Bank. And Deutsche Bank spooks. And on and on, I don't want to belabor the point, Tom, but these markets are extremely fragile, much more than anybody looking at it over the last decade would imagine, because the market just seems to be protected by the Fed no matter what happens. There's the Fed, Fed put. The Fed does what they need to do with the discount window. They flood liquidity into the primary brokers, make more money, and the circle goes on. And it works until it doesn't. Last example, long-term capital management. Everyone said, hey, look at this. There wasn't a bank on Wall Street that didn't want into uh, LTCM as a long-term capital management. And it worked great for, I think it was about four years. And, you know, it's very good algorithms, you know, Nobel Prize winning math guys. I love math. And they were just crushing it until they didn't. Because you can predict human behavior most of the time, you know, but you can't predict it all the time. And that's reflected in the financial markets. And it took down long-term capital management and could have taken down more than just LTCM and some New York banks. It could have taken down the system. But again, the Fed came to the rescue. And I'm not saying that was the wrong thing to do. What I am suggesting is that you can only put your finger in the dike so many times that one of these times your finger isn't fat enough or the crack you put your finger in, it stops it for a while, but then there's a crack going up and down from where your finger position is. And the whole thing, flood the floodgates open. I'm afraid that's the type of scenario we may be facing. I don't like it, 
but uh, I've studied monetary history most of my life. And the more the pressure builds, the heavier the price to pay. And we've just continued to put our finger in the dike and pretend that we can fix it and the dam's going to hold forever. And it won't. Nothing lasts forever. And it's certainly a corrupt, obscene, elite-run monetary system that's beholden to the very few at the top that basically screws everybody else cannot last forever. So, David, what what do you think is the next logical progression of that system? You know, if or when we move to to central bank digital currencies and more outright, let's say, MMT policies, could we see that have you know a, a great effect on the market for a year or two? And uh, as you say, you know, have that work until it truly doesn't, and the, the system truly does implode. Great question. Uh, I'm not trying to be cute. You know me too well. I'm going to give you two answers. So you ask me, you know, what would would be the logical thing? So I'm going to get put on my logic hat and answer that part of the question. The logical thing would be is for Powell or some international banker type or a group of them to stand up and tell the truth. The logic would be, here's the problem. We've overprinted and we can never pay it back. Very succinct statement of truth to everybody in the financial markets, which is global. All right, now we've said what the problem is. Now what's the solution? I don't really have one, but it would go something like this. There's a lot of bad debt in the system. And that bad debt has to be accounted for. So from now on, every corporation that has corporate bonds out there that cannot service them based on their productive capacity, in other words, their profits, they will, the market will determine their true value. All governments, sovereign debt that have exceeded what their tax base is allowed to pay back will be allowed to float to what the market determines. So you'd have a huge deflation. You would have a system where these bonds that are worth you know $1,000 face value might be worth um, 500 or whatever. Just giving an example. I don't know what it would do. It would be huge deflationary but it would also clear the market. In other words, you would allow, you'd state the problem and say, we're stepping back. We're going to let the market sort this out instead of trying to centrally control everything. So that's the logic of it. Will that happen? No. Well, <laughs> it could, but going to what you alluded to and succinctly said is you're correct, Tom. There's, it's very clear. I wrote this in the paid version of Morgan Report months ago. You outlined it perfectly. Uh, Carney, when he was with the Bank of England, said it at the United Nations. He said it at Davos, and he said it at uh, Jackson Hole. So he said it to the Fed. He said it to the UN, uh, and he said it to the elite at uh, the World Economic Forum, or used to be called Davos. And here it is: we want MMT. We want it totally unbacked. We've got complete control, and we want no cash. So that's their goal. So it's not like they don't understand what I just outlined as far as how fragile the system is. They just want to make a new one and have complete control of it and make it even more onerous than it already is. Mm -hmm. So why don't you ask me another question? Because I think I want to be succinct on that answer. And that's, that's it in a nutshell. Well, I, I'd like to relate it to something we were talking about earlier. And that's, and that's about, you know, the, the risk that China poses if they are the first ones to introduce a CBDC maybe backed by gold. How would that affect the U.S. dollar and other currencies around the world? Well, if it were backed by gold, then you would probably see a lot of sovereign debt move into that market if they you know, offer you know, bonds uh, or even just the currency. I mean, you know, anything that's the first to be backed by gold would probably suck up a lot of, uh, you know, free floating currencies out there. I don't know. Um, first of all, China, let's get the facts straight. The CCP already has the first really government backed digital currency. In fact, in China, roughly 500,000 or so, which is mostly their city folks can only buy stuff with their phone. They don't have any cash. Everything is done with the 10 cent or the Weebe or whatever it is app. <clears throat> it's all done electronically with their digital currency. The gold question is really important. Uh, you know, most of your 
sovereigns do have gold. Um, in fact, I'll be writing the Morgan Report this week, and one pointed out by uh, Boyan Star, who they do great work, is Singapore has increased their gold supply about 20% recently. So I'll be mentioning that in my report, but I think it will come back to gold. Uh, I don't know if it'd be the Chinese that would lead it. So I really don't want to go too far because I'm not guessing, guessing, but I really don't know. But I do strongly think that whoever goes to gold will be the one that will be leading the next, uh, call it reserve currency of the world, if there is such a thing. If it goes the Carney method, and then the Chinese will probably just step in line and um, do whatever. I think there could be uh, a breakaway, as you said, or I'll say you're suggesting, maybe now you can correct me that, you know, maybe that's their plan is like, look, the dollar's days have gone. And I, and I just had a thought that's important. If you study monetary history, what you find is whoever has the gold makes the rules. I know we've heard that a thousand times. But if you go back to, um, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, you know, uh, the sun never stopped shining on the empire. And it was their gold uh, and their monetary system that was the most trusted in the world. And that was the main base for the financial system. Reserve currency was the pound. And then as things continued to deteriorate, it was the United States. The United States had most of the gold. And then they became the reserve currency of the world. Well, most of us that study this matter are very much convinced that China has most of the gold. So it only fits with what you just said, Tom, and I want to get that on the record, that it's more than likely that that could take place. I'm just not convinced yet. Mm -hmm. And it, it, exactly as you as you put there, David, we, we've seen Singapore come and, you know, add to their gold reserve since the, for the first time since at least the year 2000. And we've seen demand for gold eagles be the largest since 2009 for this year. So does this show us how smart money and big money players are actually quite fearful and are turning towards age-old physical assets right now? Glad to use the word, Tom, because I was, you know, when we speak, I'm not the best listener I try to be. <laughs> but as you were asking the question, I had my answer. It was fear. You're right. It's fear. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we when we think about that, the demand soaring for gold, we've also seen silver hit uh, very likely what's going to be over a billion ounces of demand for this year. So when, David, does that catch up with the price action? Does this, does this you know, considering that we've had this, you know, insane demand that we've seen, does that show us that there is actually a lot more silver um, in, in above ground stores that's available for sale at these prices than uh, really most people thought there was? Well, certainly that's one take. I think, you know, you would hear that from some more of the apologist side. And the truth is, I don't know exactly, but I do understand how much leverage is in the system we discussed initially in our conversation. And it's my strong opinion based on the commitment of traders and the days of a that are sold in the silver market exceeds anything in any other commodities market. It's my strong belief, and I can prove it mathematically as far as the amount, that there certainly is enough physical silver to meet the physical call on silver at this time. We don't know all the details, so I'll give you a quick example. If you're in the paper market, which is what the silver market is, the silver market is a derivatives market. The silver I hold it in my hand market is basically based on the retail market. Now, you can go to the futures market and you can say, uh, you know, I want or you can demand, you know, delivery. But your demanded delivery in your contract says it can be settled in cash. And that's my mm -hmm. point. I've had not many, but maybe three or four, um, some members, some not, doesn't matter if they're a member or not contact me and show me their uh, brokerage receipt where they asked for delivery and they were settled in cash. And there's not a damn thing those people can do about it because they signed the contract. Mm -hmm. But that's my point, Tom. So I think a better question, I'm not picking on you. In fact, this is more on me than on you. 
is that really what we should ask is, is there enough physical silver to meet the demand? The answer is it appears to be so. Mm -hmm. But what we don't know is how many of those contracts are settled in cash that actually won in silver. Now, it hasn't been to the level where anybody's screaming yet. But if you want to go down the rabbit hole, put on a tinfoil hat and be a real conspiracy theorist, the semiconductor market takes 44 million ounces of silver on an annual basis. Just think about it for a second as a conspiracy theory that if one of the main reasons for the semiconductor shortage is they're not getting enough silver to pump them out fast enough. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying yeah. that's the case. I'm just trying to throw a rabbit down the hole. That's all. <laughs> well, like you say, there's there's so many different examples like that that can be that can could be pointed to as as possible theories or explanations for um, you know supply shortages. So, David, I, I know you've looked at these markets for for many many years. Where do you think our thesis could be wrong? Certainly, obviously, there are. You know, when we see the metals dip on a day when inflation is announced that it's running hotter than um, even the Fed expected, how does that show us the the way we normally think of the the role of the metals? Like, how could we be wrong still? Well, I think we could be wrong um, that the mindset is has been changed enough with enough people that you will never get what you saw in the set, late seventies. You know, the run to gold may not happen. I could be wrong about that. Um, I don't think I am because of the amount of bank participation in the gold market. No one uses silver as a monetary asset or a monetary base. If that were the case, you can go look at about three lectures I did on what if silver were treated like gold. Mm -hmm. It goes into the idea that silver was a reserve asset like gold. But I digress. So it could be as... The movie I was in, the Four Horse or the yeah Four Horsemen film, and I think it's Julian Tennant. I think is how you say her name. Very bright woman uh, writes for the Financial Times of you know the UK, and she started off and said, you know, it's the cognitive map that needs to be controlled. So it's not the money supply, it's not the bond market, it's not interest rates. It's not currency swaps. It's not the gold market. It's not silver's getting hammered. It's a cognitive map. It's how you make people think. So if you can get enough people to think that, you know, gold markets passe, it has no place in the current financial system, you probably, that could be my mistake or our mistake. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do I think that's the case? And the answer is I, I don't. But I, I could admit I'm wrong. Certainly, it's it's confounding those of us that lived through what I did and saw what I witnessed with the run to gold. Um, I'll go one step further. I went with uh, was at the CME, the you know in Chicago, and Rick Santelli was out there. I hope Rick doesn't mind. He's smoking. I don't care if he smokes. <laughs> and he was leaning against the wall. And I came up to him and I introduced myself, and um, I've gotten to know him a little bit. He knows who I am, but uh, not at that time. And so we started chatting. He said, what are you here for? And I told him. And then uh, he said, way back, and this was a long time ago, I don't think gold has much place in the markets anymore. You know, you were right about in the 70s and early 80s. But now, this had to be probably in the early 2000s, I'm guessing, so 20 years ago or so. There's too many financial instruments. Gold just gets buried. There's so many other choices that investors have that gold really, you know, put words in his mouth to best of my recollection. Gold doesn't really have much of a chance, basically. Mm-hmm. And of course, me being a gold bug, hard money guy, honest money, knowing that these systems always collapse at every time in history where there's been a, you know, distrust of government on a level that caused enough people, which is like one or 2% out of 100%, so a very small percentage, that decided they didn't trust government, they trusted gold, that went to it, you know, cause this big rush in as far as what was its value relative to other goods and services. We really don't want to say what's it worth in terms of paper. The paper may be failing. So if that one ounce buys you a men's suit, one ounce buys you half a men's warehouse, it's overvalued. And I think that's what could happen. But no, in my darker moments, Tom, I will admit that uh, I do look at what could be wrong. My answer stands. It could be the cognitive map. Enough people have lost touch with uh, gold's place in monetary history and it's passe 
and the um, Mr. Carney's of the world have got everybody locked into a cryptocurrency, you know, backed by nothing, and you will like it. Mm-hmm. So exactly in that vein, David, how have cryptocurrencies affected the demand and, and price action in the metals? Are, are they on their way to replacing the, the physical assets with, with a digital alternative? I think so. I think that's what the banks want. They want a central bank digital currency. So it is centralized, not decentralized. They've got a lot of the millennials uh, hooked on the idea, the cognitive map, the thinking that this is the way to go. It is the future. I'm making all this money. Uh, in fact, I don't even have to work. All I got to do is buy one Bitcoin and play video games and I'm going to have a wonderful life. So these things don't fit with reality, but they do at this time, just like long-term capital management. All I got to do is give my money and get a 20% compounded rate of return every year. Those type of things usually don't last forever. Time will tell. I'm skeptical. Um, I think there needs to be a great uh, financial reset, not as envisioned by the World Economic Forum, but by by envisioned by Mother Nature of Markets, the market itself. And I still believe that that will happen, at least in some form, where there'll be some type of a, a reset. And I'm not saying the bankers are going to lose. They usually win, believe me. I, don't, I know that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they may in this case. But as the, as the old adage goes, you know, everything works out in the end. And we're not at the end yet, so I'm still hoping everything will work out. So, David, considering how important it is to get you know perspective in some of these positions, how should we be measuring our wealth? Should we be thinking of it in terms of silver uh, ounces or gold ounces rather than dollars? Well, I do for a part. You know, I mean, I try to help the community, which is quite small, as you know, Tom. And you now, if you have a hundred ounce bar and you check the paper price and it's dropped thirty percent, but over that year, you've added two, you have two 100 ounce bars. By definition, you have more silver and you're wealthier. I mean, you would never have that, that concept if you were in medieval times or the Roman times or, you know, most of history. I mean, if you had more silver, you had more wealth. If you had more gold, you had more wealth. It's only when you've got to measure it against something that is a imaginary fiction, a fractional reserve accounting unit denomination, fraud, fractional, uh, fractional recording accounting unit denomination. That's what the Federal Reserve note is. It's an accounting unit that's made out of thin air that has no real value. And we're always worried about what that is relative to our piece of gold. You know, change your thinking. Mm-hmm. So kind of in that in that vein as well, David, how are you seeing sentiment right now? I know for, for myself personally, we've gotten a lot of negative comments about the metals recently. So how do you find, you know, where sentiment is right now? And in your experience, is that a good indicator of things, you know, turning around? It is. And, you know, as much as I've had my emotions in check regarding markets in general, and particularly the metals, because I've lived through it so many times, Mm -hmm. there's still times when, oh, come on. I mean, right now, Tom, you know, my center is, I can't believe silver's a, a print under 23 today as we're doing the interviews. You know, and I just, you know, one of my more recent videos was pretty assuring that we would get into perhaps the, oh, 2450, 23 level. I forget, I want to misstate it for my paid members, but I didn't really see us under 23 again. And it hurts and it gnaws on you and it makes you question your conviction and all those things, but it is a great, reverse indicator, Um, you know, the old adage, never sell a quiet market is a very good adage. So basically the best advice I've learned to have is to hold it, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's interesting to me that, and I'm digressing a bit to make the point that in the crypto world, this word or this acronym HODL is pervasive. It's everywhere. Just hold on for dear life. So you can hold on for dear life no matter what happens to some of these cryptos. But when it comes to the silver market, there aren't many hodlers, right? There's complainers. It's like, oh, it went down. I'm looking at go tell me to hodl or some stuff. Hodl. Hodl your silver. Hodl your gold. But don't get overextended. That's the main thing I've seen year over year over year. People understand how corrupt the financial system is. They put themselves on like an all gold and silver standard neglecting all their asset classes, and then it does nothing while all these other asset classes soar, 
and then they're upset. Well, you know, that's not what I teach. I say 20%, you know, and I think that's about the right amount. And then you could have these other asset classes. Will the metals take off and become the star performers like they were from the year 2000 to 2011? And I want to spend a little time here, Tom, you know, if we were doing this interview in that decade, you know, I'd be a star, you know, it's like, Oh, gold. And I said, yeah, it's going to keep going up. And it did. And every year for 11 years in a row, gold had a better print every year. So, you know, we had that decade of, you know, gold is good. Gold is great. Gold's the best investment. Gold, blah, 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 blah. you know, and now we've had another decade where we've been, you know, building this big base that's gone from, you know, roughly 1900 down to what, 1100 and back up to, I don't know, I think we're under 1800 now on gold if I check the numbers right. But anyway, all markets move up and down. I don't think the story's over. If you have the right amount, you can be um, pretty solid about it. When you have bet too much and the market doesn't go your way, and your best friend just bought some STIF coin and the thing's going up 200% every other week. You feel left out, fear of missing out and all this stuff. But the markets have a very, very good ability to bring, bring reality to everyone. Mm-hmm. And I think that we're past due as far as that hard rain that's going to fall. And it's going to take things and wash through the system at large. Again, the bankers have their plan, but it isn't implemented yet. We'll have to see. It's very trying times. Um, one step further, Tom, on the, on the coins, you know, silver coins and gold coins. I mean, there could be, and I think will be, especially outside of the U.S., although it'll be in the U.S. as well. There'll be a real market or a free market. It'll be called a black market. It'll be called a lot of negative things. But you can also, always throughout financial history will find that as things get more and more oppressive, more tyrannical, more oh, laws, <clears throat> people still look after their own self-interest. And even at the risk of uh, whatever the purveyors have to offer as far as punishment, They'll take that risk to continue to work with others of like mind. Uh, you know, that's what the John Galt thing is all about with Atlas Shrugged. You know, some of the best thinkers just basically gave up on the corrupt system and moved out to an area where they could do their own transactions in their own way uh, with integrity. Mm-hmm. So, David, you were, you kind of mentioned how there are are people that complain maybe about the the fact that that silver doesn't move up right now and in in some respects i try on the show to to provide a very balanced um you know and and hopefully truthful way of looking at the markets i don't i it's it's hard to keep promising you know silver is going up you know up and up to $100 tomorrow kind of thing and this kind of brings us to the the truth idea you were recently on a panel at the Silver Symposium with Jeff Christian earlier this year, and many people thought that you kind of came out to support him in that exchange. Certainly, there must be things that you both agree and disagree on, but how did you see the situation play out from your perspective? Well, my favorite word, interesting. I mean, you know, we had uh, agreed to do this, you know, exchange, and then we had uh, the Economic Ninja as the MC, which was really a good thing. And then he started taking questions from the audience and it got kind of heated. And, uh, you know, I guess a few swear words flying back and forth and I'm sitting there going, oh, my, my, now what do I do? But, uh, you know, I didn't defend Jeff. I defended the truth. The truth is the uh, information that Jeff brought forth and uh, produced at the Silver Summit a few years prior was extremely accurate and I vetted most of it and called uh, people that I know and trusted to trading desks and asked us basically the same questions he did and verified pretty much everything he had uh, put out. So I just basically made that statement, tried to move on and it did quiet the crowd and we did move on. So, you know, a defender of truth. I mean, Jeff and I don't agree on everything. I think our main 
disagreement is the collapse. I say there will be one. He says there won't be one. I say we're in it now. He says not yet. Although the ninja was very smart. He asked him, you know, what was the 30s? A collapse. And Jeff said, yes. So from my perspective, we're heading that way rather rapidly, but time will tell. I'm also old enough to know that two people could see exactly the same thing and see it differently. And I respect that. I mean, you know, there's people that are on the left or the right. I'm libertarian, hardly even that anymore. But, you know, I try to look at both sides and listen. And, you know, maybe I'm still on a particular side of an issue, but someone on the other side brought more light to the topic. So I might not change my opinion drastically. Mm -hmm but change it nonetheless or move it or whatever. So, you know, I'm always open to getting more data or whatever. And that's what science is all about. You know, I mean, science is, they have a hypothesis, they do the scientific method, they come up and here's the theory on it. You get more data, more information. You learn how to look uh, deeper with the microscope than you ever have before. You see new, new, uh, a different situation. Oh my God, we never thought of it that way, but it's right in front of us. Okay. So it changes. And, um, so I, I want to keep that in mind. Yeah, I think that's a great point, David. And you know, you can you can see the exact same thing. You can, for example, use the the same word. If you say if you say collapse, and uh, for example, Jeff says collapse, you could mean two totally different things. Yeah. So it's always important how we define those things to try and have that that nuanced discussion around it. Right. Right. That's good observation. Thanks for backing me up because. You know, I think my mom said it, and many say, you know, one man's treasure, one man's, you know, trash is another man's treasure. I mean, same thing, different perspective. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, and on the silver stuff, I mean, Jeff and I, I use Jeff's numbers for most of the stuff. I also use the Silver Institute. I kind of blend them and I try not to cherry pick. I try to be objective when I really don't know I average them. But no one knows the exact amount of recycling. No one knows the exact amount of uh, what I call burrow silver, what you alluded to earlier, Tom. Like, is there a lot more above ground silver than maybe we're accounting for? Yeah, there's more than probably we've accounted for. But how much? I don't know. And I don't think Jeff knows or anyone knows. But there is, you know, mines that are um, what I call burrow mines are small. They produce silver. And then the recycling side, I mean, you know, these are mom and pop operations. Some are very, very lucrative, but uh, some of these people are, uh, you know, sleeping on king size bed, and the base is uh, solid silver. <laughs> so that's not reported, you know. So, mm -hmm. and that's, I think, one of our challenges in in this, you know, I, I want to say industry is that if you have a big hoard of gold or silver, of course you you don't want a bunch of people to know. Sure. Um, you know, that's, that's private information. It makes you a target, let's say. Excellent, David. Well, I think that's a, a good place to kind of wrap up this interview. We can find more from you at themorganreport.com and um, on your Twitter feed uh, at silverguru22 as well. David, is there any other thoughts you'd like to share with us before we do wrap up? Yeah, let me get a bit philosophical. We haven't done this one, but just, you know, there's a lot of stress on everybody. And I think it's, beholding to us as humans to, you know, think with our head and heart, especially maybe now with the holidays coming up, uh, you know, there's more to life than money. I mean, if money becomes an obsession, that's just what it is. It's an obsession. It's important to me and it has been my life's work to make the monetary system an honest system for everybody involved, bottom up, top down. It's equal. And it's not as we started this interview. But nonetheless, some of the best, and this, I had a hard time with not for years and years, not for decades, but, you know, I used to not even like the adage that the best things in life are free. I just didn't think that was correct. Of course, for years, I do now. But I think we need to be a little more grateful for what we have. You know, the key I've learned to happiness is appreciating what you have. You know, and, and what's enough is a different thing. It's that, you know, so people could see the same thing and see it differently. Someone might say, well, that guy has a very modest lifestyle, but maybe they're happier than hell because they have all that they want, all that they need, and life is good. And you could have someone else that has 10 times the amount and they're miserable. 
because they just aren't satisfied with what they have. They have to have more. So I'll leave it there, Tom. I hope that helps. Well, David, as always, I, I really appreciate your perspective and your, your sage advice there. Thanks so much for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.